We have a venerable tradition that goes deep into human history. We can look at the Tashili Plains. We can go to Angkor Wat. We can look all over the world and find in Iboga ceremonies, in Gabon, in Africa. These are visionary sacraments and have been so for centuries. The Shipibo talk of the ayahuasca DMT slash harmine harmaline mix as a means to see the pattern of existence and life itself. And this is a song to the uh, Shipibo, and they could sing it. And when they look at the uh, patient uh, in that tradition, it's the doctor that takes the medicine. And uh, when he looks at the patient and sees something's a little out of balance, then he sings a remedy into it that rebalances it. The healing power of music and art making, the repatterning of our consciousness. They put it on everything. Hmm, what do you think? They like tattoos, just like our tribe. They like to put it on their clothing. And Pablo Amaringo was one of the great Peruvian uh, shaman that became a painter. And so he opened up a portal of uh, uh, beings and ideas and uh, entire realms and dimensions of consciousness that only those who had journeyed would understand. And so more and more people gathered around that did understand. And he formed a school. And uh, then uh, in league with that, there was a growth in the ayahuasca churches in Peru and in Brazil. And we've got the uh, Santo Daime religion. We've got the Unio de Vegetal. Uh, and the Unio, Unio de Vegetal was the first ayahuasca church that was brought to America. And uh, we'll find out the story of what happened there. Well, we have, uh, I would say, uh, if you want to go to the real old-time religion in terms of American culture, you'd be looking at peyote. You'd be looking at uh, the Native American church and their connection with the sacrament. This is a great uh, example of the universality of uh, psychedelic uh, iconography. Here we have a peyote bird. It was inherent to their uh, ceremony and their belief structure, uh, which is an animal not unlike the Holy Spirit, uh, as portrayed in the Christian church of the flying dove. Why do all angels have wings? Why is the feather an important thing? We're talking about higher realms, higher worlds. This is the most direct example. And you see three basic mandalas in an arrangement up the center there. So this, this is the same kind of visions that would happen to any of us tonight if we smoked some DMT or something. You know, we'd start to see uh, the crystalline matrices of interlocking sacred geometries uh, ascend through the uh, luminous uh, subtle body, and it would come out the crown here. And so now we have insight into the visionary uh, uh, kind of reference point of the feathers. Why do uh, the native people wear feathers? And why does this liken to the most colorful and amazing realms that humanity has uh, consciousness with? So we weave it. We put it into our textiles. We weave the sacrament into the sacred ceremony. The animal world is not apart from the sacred dimension, and hence we're not cut off from nature. As a tribe, it's been important to come back to nature and not just hang out in warehouses in the city. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We like that too. <laughs> so we, like, we, we love the city too. Not saying, 
But this is where we get enveloped by the Great Mother, and we can feel it in a more raw and potent form. And so the Huichole, a very vital culture that has maintained its relationship to the peyote and to the psychedelic world in all of their patterning and that uh, cascades over their sculptures and their yarn paintings, which are extraordinary. Uh, the shaman uh, and the sacrament are this ongoing archetype, the teacher and the teaching. Now, all of those uh, cultures going back thousands of years to the foundation of Eastern and Western civilization is what I would call visionary culture. They're connected with all of these, uh, the, the richest uh, super conscious archetypes uh, of our uh, potential, the visionary mystical experience. So now at this time when we've been obsessed with the outer world and with the materialist focus in how do we improve our technology, it's been really important, you know, we've, but we've, through successive waves of alienation from nature, now we are <laughs> at a crossroads. We are there. <laughs> the great uplifting of humanity beyond its self-destruction is the redemptive mission of art. Now, I would say of creative expression in general, not just, I, I mean it in the most general way possible. And how else but by being creative are we going to get ourselves out of this mess? It's not by the same consciousness, uh, as Einstein said, that we're going to solve the problem that we got ourselves into. We have to ascend. How are we going to do it? Well, around post-war uh, uh, times, uh, artists started experimenting with uh, peyote and with uh, LSD and with uh, psilocybin, and they started to integrate their, uh, uh, the capacity of rendering in the West uh, with this new visionary world, a dimension that had been uh, depicted before by William Blake and Hieronymus Bosch and perhaps Van Eyck and others, but Ernst Fuchs was one of the greatest and still uh, uh, living uh, great exponents of visionary art. And here is uh, one of his cherubs and a self-portrait as Christ. Now, I, one of his greatest students was Matty Carwine, who uh, became identified with the sort of psychedelic art movement in the 60s. And is a special kind of intense, visionary, uh, include everything uh, kind of painting. This painting was called A Grain of Sand. And it was the uh, kind of the top chakra of the uh, Olive Sanctuary, which was his temple uh, built out of his um, paintings. And in a way, the kind of visionary art environments that we build now in some way resonate with, and Maddie would absolutely adore them, and he would love you all. Uh, I'm, he's no longer with us, but uh, he's, he hovers with spirit. Like all the structures here, yeah. for instance, how creative they are. Now, at a certain time, LSD was not illegal yet, and during this time, it was a great experiment. And, uh, and in a way, we can hear the echoes of Woodstock in uh, so many of the uh, festivals that uh, occurred today, because so, never before had hundreds of thousands of people gathered in one place and tripped. <laughs> it, right? It was a benchmark. It was. It it meant something uh, to the to the devas and dakinis and angels and the other spiritual beings that that hang out, kind of watching, you know, as as we're destroying ourselves. And they're saying, hmm, I don't know, maybe that could be positive. Uh, you got the greatest uh, guitarist of all times pointing to Sky Church. Right? We've got one going on. You guys set up a resonant field already. The real Sky Church is here with us. We're dancing with the elementals and with the celestials right through us. We're right in the middle and getting both ways. Woo! <laughs> Thank you, God. We're gathering together in uh, groups because it's the opposite of war. Yeah. You know? 
the expressions of visionary cultures, creative people wage peace, right? They love, this is the love tribe. Since the 60s, everybody has known it, and it is worldwide. That's what's encouraging. That's what, even given everything, you should know you've got family all over the world, and they will risk themselves, as you have, and even more dangerous situations, in order to gather and affirm that you exist, that we exist, and that we will exist. And th this festival culture, I have to see, and I, I hope you wouldn't be scared of the word, but I see it as a religious phenomenon. Yeah. Now, I know that that's a, a kind of a, okay, a disorganized religion, but I like that. I like that. That's what art is, you know. The worst thing about religion, I guess, is that they're so dogmatic. You know, they think they know. Now, art is the opposite of that. Art says, we don't know shit. <laughs> How are we going to do this thing? You know? Right? And you'll go any way you can. You'll invent it. Because it doesn't come from you in the end. It's the intelligence network working through us as one thing. And that's the big illusion, you know, that we're not one thing. But that was ever after, uh, the, you know, that uh, massive shift, uh, then there were reverberations. And the rainbow gatherings, higher consciousness leads to higher conscience. There's no other way it can be true. And those religious geniuses like Martin Luther King, what an inspiration. That here, here is a person who could turn the entire context of a culture. And it was like a drop. But this stance, a stand for what they knew was right, was what turned things around and became mass movements. And that's, even if we just kind of realize it, I think it's why we're here. I think this is activism, perhaps psychoactivism. Uh, it was also part of the pressure that would change political realities or at least allow the suffering of the people to be known and, you know, impossible to dismiss. So these peace rallies and gatherings at festivals affirming our values together is what helps unite us and helps us to understand that we can vision a better world together. Now, I'd really like to propose that we start thinking about um, and theogens as a civil right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The religious use of entheogens is mired in drug war rhetoric as an excuse to silence people who think differently. The drug war is a war against higher consciousness and higher consciousness part of a greater corporate war against nature. So I hope you're all familiar with Graham Hancock's War on yeah. Consciousness, the, <laughs> the, the uh, banned uh, TED talk. So uh, this is uh, how, how uh, when, when you start to uh, in, uh, meet resistance, a physics friend said, that's when you know you've engaged the inertia. And you have to do that before you can make any positive movement or change. All right? So resistance is not negative. All right? It's just part of the transformation. And uh, we have to realize that people who take entheogens are an oppressed minority. Right? Right? Right. We are an oppressed minority. <laughs> All right. Or maybe it's a majority and we just don't know. <laughs> I think it is 
a majority, actually. I mean, look at the cannabis. There's 55% of American voters think this is a non-issue. Legalize, please. Right? That's a majority. And that's a fact. The outlawing of plants that have a long and venerable religious traditional usage is anti-sacramental. Right? Okay. Uh, I, I just want to say how important words are and that I've been trying to think of a word that would help define, I guess, quote, the, uh, the surrounding culture that is so painful to so many. Now, when the word anti-Semitic came up, it was a, it was a kind of a uh, noticing of, oh, there are people who make differences there. When the term racist was coined, then you start to put things in a context like, oh, yeah, you don't want to be racist. I don't want to be, no, I'm not anti-Semitic. <coughs> Why, uh, I'm not a misogynist. You see how important that word is? To understand what happens, how we get opposed and oppressed in terms, terminology. So by that minority coining a phrase and agreeing on it, using it somehow, uh, then, uh, uh, so, well, it, it, it at least frames the argument, okay? Uh, and I don't want to dwell on the negative, but I just, <laughs> too late for that, sir. Uh, all right. But do you see how important the word homophobia has been and homophobe? Do you see how you don't want to be that, really? You know? And you want to allow what has occurred naturally through strenuous and absolutely relentless effort on the part of the uh, lesbian, gay, uh, bi, and uh, trans community to make it a civil rights issue. And it is. And there is freedom. So, okay. So I'm just proposing the word anti-sacramental as something we start looking at. Okay. So... The use of entheogens is a fundamental human right to cognitive liberty and a civil right to freedom of religion. The Unio de Vegetal in 2006, led by Jeffrey Bronfman, uh, got a Supreme Court victory for his ayahuasca church, the UDV, after a five-year fight that led all the way to the Supreme Court. So they are... Uh, they are the UDV. They are uh, the first, and there's probably six uh, chapters or more in the United States now of legal uh, uh, ayahuasca churches that use it in a very, uh, uh, y you know, ceremonial and beautiful way. And uh, I, I have to say that the, these uh, entheogens uh, are the only uh, existing uh, world uh, kind of. Uh, uh, tradition that has been uh, scientifically investigated, actually, and has given a 65% at least in two studies now, two uh, double-blind studies, uh, one, the most recent uh, run by Roland Griffiths uh, at Johns Hopkins, has verified that a majority of spiritually inclined subjects had a full-blown mystical experience after a single dose of psilocybin. Okay, so it's the only scientifically proven means to repeatedly experience the mystical experience, which is uh, the, the means of connectedness with the divine. Walter Pankey first did it at the Good Friday Experiment back in 1962 before the great oppression of the, you know, like 40 years in the desert with no psychedelic research because of uh, uh, things that uh, went down. Okay, so Arnold Toynbee, who's a uh, philosopher of civilization, uh, spent his entire life studying civilizations. And uh, he said that uh, he believed, after this year of, of uh, or this, uh, his lifetime of study, that civilizations exist to give birth to better religions. Civilizations exist to give birth to better religions. 
That's really interesting. Because uh, he was saying that religions are at the center, at the core of every new civilization. If you don't have a mystical understanding of reality at the center of a civilization, you don't have one. And so, uh, we've just said that uh, psychedelics are the only scientifically proven means to access to the divine. And religion is basically a, a means uh, to tying oneself back. Uh, religio means to uh, religare, to fasten or bind back, uh, to tie oneself back to the transcendental ground of being, to the ultimate reality and ultimate meaning. And the practices and beliefs for uniting with God or primordial awareness. <laughs> so we understand at this time, in order, in this very brief amount of time, uh, that entheogens heal souls and they transform habits of consumption to, and that may be part of, and I'm not saying they're the only thing, I'm saying meditation is the royal road. I'm saying yoga accelerates us. I'm saying none of us really need it if we're really tapped in. But... Yeah. Yeah. And some people, of course, should avoid it entirely because we don't want to catalyze any uh, bipolar or, or uh, you know, like uh, borderline personality kind of issues. So use caution, of course, always. But, uh, but, but we can also look at entheogens as uh, a radical means of awakening and of reconnecting us with uh, the sacred field of nature. And uh, it may be that this uh, could help in the turning the ship around away from eco-catastrophe in progress, right? Yeah. Yeah. So why does visionary art matter? Well, visionary mystical experiences are humanity's most direct contact with God and are the creative source of all sacred art and wisdom traditions. The best currently existing technology for sharing the mystic imaginal realms is a well-crafted artistic rendering by an eyewitness. <laughs> That's why visionary art matters. Mm. Now, um, the uh, uh, entheogens as, as part of it may play part of it, but they are just one means of connecting us with the divine. Now, our creativity uh, as a religious stance, the, the, the arts directly link us with all of human expression from the cave art, you know, like tens of thousands of years ago through every sacred art development throughout all culture. If art is your uh, basically religion, then you're connected with all religions because they all had creative expression. So, uh, so as artists, you know, uh, you follow that creative directive that you are most in heart contact with, and you band together and build stuff together. You're uh, so. Uh, let's see. All right, religions are all expressions of the one divine, true spirit of love, creating the cosmos. All right, we covered that. So we got great artists. We got Mark Henson. Uh, who's directly showing us in this painting like the uh, how artists are waging peace with their uh, visions and their creative expressions of all kinds. And it helps to point out these, uh, you know, realities that we have to wrestle with and we have to work with. And it points to a positive future, you know, of a life uh, where we can imagine a sustainable relationship with nature, you know. Why is it easier for some to imagine uh, apocalypse uh, than the end of uh, capitalism? <laughs> you know? So we're imagining something different. And we've seen something different. We've seen uh, great reasons to be very positive. And part of it is the affirmation of the infinitude of the inner worlds, like portrayed by Roberto Venosa, our dear friend, and uh, his partner, Martina Hoffman, uh, one of the great visionary artists. Hey, come to Cosm soon. Very soon. Yep. Next week. Lawrence Caruana, recently at Cosm, uh, is uh, uh, 
forming with a number of visionary artists, a uh, Vienna Visionary Art Institute. And uh, this is his uh, uh, kind of Gnostic Christ related to the Shipibo. Ariala, California visionary here is uh, the, his uh, DMT elf thing. My favorite artist, Allison Gray. Why, why, why do I paint chaos, order, and secret writing? Okay, I portray the sacred as abstract. Okay, I, I come from the visionary tradition of, of being inspired through uh, entheogens and portray it as an abstract will. And I'm, I'm really glad to see that the abstract visionary artists are growing, growing movement now. But anyway, I've committed myself to chaos, order, and secret.